Hi everybody, thanks for coming. I'm Officer Scott A. Fonts from the Dartmouth Police Department. Officer Justin Fonseca, from, also from Dartmouth PD. We're also members of the uh, Semlec Search and Rescue Team. Uh, the Semlec Search and Rescue Team is a, uh, a regional team with, uh, I believe, 30, 28 different communities around, and we're up to uh, 40 uh, members on, on the team. Um, basically, uh, we have a couple members from each, each uh, municipality that can get called out for any other of the 28 communities for missing a lost person, evidence searches, anything along those lines that, that they could use us for. Um, today we're going to talk about um, some of the stuff that's available and uh, what we can do to kind of help the people in the community that are uh, prone to wander, either with Alzheimer's or dementia or autism or any other kind of situation they can wander off or get lost in the woods. Um, reason why we're here, like I said, people with Alzheimer's, children, adults with, Alzheimer, uh, with autism, children or adults with Down syndrome, people with brain injuries, mental illness, or people with intellectual disabilities. Um, these are all like 2011 studies. Um, half of the people that uh, have gone missing have been found within 24 hours. Um, some individuals went missing on multiple occasions. Usually we found the studies that they've done is if somebody wanders away once, somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, they're gonna do it again. And again, it's what's that first time once they do it. Um, usually sometimes they, we had a uh, case in Whitman where um, the person wandered away from his home. He was in the woods. Um, we went looking for him in this swampy area and he, he heard us calling his name and he just, he didn't respond to us. Um, he had a, a developmental uh, issues and um, what we ended up doing in that case was we just everybody came out of the woods and we just listened for the sounds in the woods and we ended up finding them and once we found them he came right out with us. Um, these are just some of the facts that uh, we've seen out there. 127,000 people get lost annually in the United States. 34,000 reported to police. Approximately 13,000 people are never found. Um, and we are required to search for these people with uh, diminished capacity who, who are, are missing. Um, this is some of the stats of nursing homes. Um, this is countrywide. We haven't had any issues that I know of, in, uh, definitely in town or any other local where somebody's gone uh, missing from a nursing home. They're pretty, as far as I know, they're pretty secure. Autism and wanting. 92% of parents with children who are at autism are at risk for wandering. Among the, uh, the elevated deaths, usually autism children, when they go missing, they wander away, they go towards power lines and water. Um, nobody's able to tell why, but that's, that's kind of what they do. Those, those usually, if we go looking for someone with autism, that's usually the first choice is where we go look for power lines and uh, and water, pools, ponds, any, any kind of body of water. Kind of dark. Um, some, this is some of the technology that's out there. Um, some of it changes from day to day, month to month. Um, different categories, radio frequency, cellular, or GPS. Low jack is uh, one of the things we're going to, uh, Ralph Poland here is going to talk about, um, one of the products that's out there. They also have, um, there's some GPS products out there, um, some, uh, some phone stuff, and you can always track, usually if they have their phone on, you can usually track them with their phone. Basically, any of the technology that's out there has its, has its limits, nothing's foolproof. GPS has um, some issues inside of a building, just like, it, just like a phone would. So a lot of that stuff works off of uh, cell stuff. So if you're in a building or deep somewhere else, sometimes you may have signals, sometimes you may not. 
it's uh, another brand of uh, GPS. Like I said before, natural barriers, mountains, thick foliage, uh, clouds, artificial obstructions, such as large buildings and dense communities can hinder satellite signals. Um, for this reason, GPS tracking inside buildings is seldom possible. Also, GPS tracking in large cities is not always reliable. Um, this is some of the stuff that I, we found out there. <coughs> there are other stuff. Um, this is some of the other, other products that are out there also. Um, I don't know too much about the uh, Kurov family direct locator, but th like I said, there are, there are different products out there to try out or, or to uh, do some research on. Um, deciding on the device. Um, whatever best surgery needs, consider following where it will be likely use, private residence, care facility, indoors, outdoors, where Will a search likely take place within a building, outdoors, in an urban or rural area, tree covered, open space, and devices which are more appropriate for these settings? And how much freedom movement would the device allow? Ne if necessary, will the person with dementia be able to use the device? Who will be doing the monitoring or locating? Family, caregiver, police, or outside agency? Good. Let me get a little bit into um, what we do on the, uh, the search and rescue team. Um, basically, this would come to if there's a missing or lost person in town, what would happen is we, you would call the local police. We would come out, start looking. If, if we couldn't find that person, um, then they would uh, they, they'd activate the team. Um, these are the communities right now that are part of uh, Semlec. Um, like I said, they, uh, they all, there's a dive team, a SWAT team, and a search and rescue team that are all part of Pasemlik. Some communities have members in each different, some of the teams, some of the other ones are, uh, you know, more so on the dive team, more so on the SWAT team, whichever. But we have, on the search and rescue part, we have 40, 40 members so far. Three major components that um, you deal with the management team, the ground search team or the investigative team. Management teams in charge of planning and mapping, they would be the ones that would show up and they would uh, manage the search under the direction of the, uh, the chief in the community that they're in. All the uh, search managers are um, certified. Uh, Officer Fontique and myself are in the process of being certified as search managers ourselves. Probably by the end of the month we should be certified also. Ground search team is mostly what we do. We're the guys, boots on the ground. We go out there, we get told a certain area to search. They send us out in a set area, you're gonna search this area for a person, an item we're looking for. I, we've gone out looking and found uh, guns using uh, home invasions out in Duxbury uh, a few years ago. And it's just, basically it's just like it is. It's a group of guys walking and looking down or looking to try to find somebody or what we're looking for kind of searches that we do, wilderness, urban, suburban, evidence searches and uh, search and rescue. We have another part of the team, they have a couple of detectives, they, uh, the investigative part, they would go to the house, they would talk to the family, they talk to the relatives, they're, they're the ones that get the information and pass it along to the managers of the search. You know, what type of medicine they are on, uh, any kind of issues they have, who do they hang out with, any, their habits, what they're wearing, any kind of things like that. That's the kind of stuff that they're going to get and pass along through the uh, search managers back to the guys. Some of the equipment that we have, metal detectors, we have night vision stuff that, it, this is all stuff that the, the team itself has as a whole, um, GPSs. We have, um, I think we have about 15 or 20 ATVs on the team, so if we have to go out for a larger search, we're looking for somebody out in the woods, that's the kind of equipment we'd use. Uh, thermal images we have also. Night vision. 
this is all the uh, type of GPS stuff that we, we would use. Us and our equipment. Um, we're also trained, all, all the members of the search and rescue team, the Semlik search and rescue team, have been trained on uh, the use of the LOJAC system. We train once or twice a year on it. Um, we just came in last, last month, we did a, uh, a search here right in town at one of the uh, properties out in Slade's Corner Road where Justin took one of the brake sets, went out in the woods. I didn't, nobody knew where he was. Walked down one of the trails and hid behind a tree and then the guys had to come from two different directions um, to end up finding him. Um, in case it gets into a, a larger search, we have access to any of these um, search teams. The uh, Mass State Police has their own search and rescue team also, Sheriff's Department, um, Fire Departments, Red Cross, EMS, and uh, there are some civilian search and rescue teams out there also. Um, this is what we're looking to do on the search and rescue team itself, the things they're looking for, uh, some of the training we're, we're looking to, uh, to get into. Um, go through some of the traditional search methods. Some of the searches we've been on. This is one of the cases, I talked briefly about one of these cases. We went out um, to Taunton. There was a 19-year-old uh, male. We went out looking for him. Um, they, the, the detectives asked if he had any kind of uh, mental issues or anything like that, but he, he walked his dog every day, took the same path every day. He was gone for a certain amount of time. What ended up happening was we located, we were searching an area that he was supposed to be in, his whole neighborhood. Never found anything involved with him at all. They end up finding him, I believe, two towns over. I think it was about eight, nine miles away. He wandered off his path, and the detectives that talked to him later on thought he might have been um, somewhere in the autism spectrum. And he just kept on walking, and he thought he was gone. We found him the next morning. I think it was Carver. Found him just walking down one of the main roads. And he thought he was gone for two or three days. He was only the next morning. I, um, this one of the important things, uh, kind of the whole reason why we're here. What to do if you have a missing or lost person, somebody wanders off. Um, I've been to a couple, Justin and I have been to a couple calls where they may have called us, you know, they're looking for them or they're waiting for them to come back. You got to pick up the phone and call us right away. Pick up the phone, call 911. You know, my husband, my wife, they wandered away, they were gone. And, and sometimes that's all it takes is, you know, we went on a call where we end up finding a male walking, he had a, uh, he was dressed, dressed to go to bed and he had slippers on in November walking down Slocum Road and we ended up finding him just, the patrol guy just came across him, somebody called it in. The woman went to do a load of laundry and in that amount of time he just got up and wandered off. And in talking to the woman the next morning, we come to realize that he had already done this before. The neighbor brought him back, he was wandering off in the woods and, um, I mean, that's one of the biggest things. The, with the research and stuff that they've done, an average person in good health can walk two miles an hour. So if somebody's waiting 20 minutes, half hour, 45 minutes before they call, that's already a mile or two miles an average person could walk away. I mean, that's already for Haven if they left from here. Um, you're, not, you're not bothering us at all by calling the police to come look for them at all. Not at all. That's what we do. That's, you know, that's what the town people pay us to do is, is to go out there and look for, for people like that. I, I mean, that's not, a, not an issue at all. I mean, the first thing you should do, somebody, if they wander or bolt away or anything like that, is to call us. Call us and we always start coming. And if they do wander off and they come back 10 minutes later, call and say you found us. And I'll, myself or Justin will come, we'll come help you out. We have some literature we can, we can do. And, and one of the big things we're trying to do is we're trying to Lack of a better term, we're trying to document these people in our community. So when we go to that house, we know that there's a child with autism, there's you know, somebody with uh, dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. So when we go there, we know what we're dealing with when we go there. And the, all the officers have been trained now in the academy how to deal with children with, with autism. So they know, they know what to do when they approach there. So you know, when they get there, they know. They know when they get there that there's a, a kid, he's you know, a child, he's 10 years old, and he's got autism, they know how to talk to him, how to speak to him, and what, 
what to do and what not to do. Um, like I said before, I mean, I can't, uh, can't say any more. You're not bothering us at all. Call us. Call us, we'll come out. And if we, you find them beforehand, then um, that's great. I mean, that's, that's the goal of us is find them and bring them home safe. Um, one of the other things, too, is if you're going to, you decide you want to go look for them, somebody's going to stay at the house. I mean, let us come. Let us start doing what we do. It's only a few minutes for a, a police cruiser to get there, you know. You could wander away from the house and go look for your loved one, and they turn around and come back, and nobody's at the house, and we're still out there looking for them. But, uh, I mean, that, that's basically what we want to talk about today. Um, anybody have any questions? Or? I know there's some, uh, there's some progress in that in Medicaid and in the federal level. Um, Ralph could talk more about that. I, I know they're, they're working on it. Um, it, may, it may be something coming. I, I, I don't want to give you the wrong answer, but I know it's, it's, in, the, it's in the legislature. They're working on it now. And I also know that the Sheriff's Department has some mm -hmm. sort of a system. Yep. That's a GPS system, or like a wristband. Yeah, it's basically the same. What Ralph's going to talk about is the same, same system. Mm -hmm. Same system, so if, if one person's on one program or another, it's not going to matter to us. It's the same system. We're going to know. Um, I have a book. Um, Lojack Safety Net has an online program that we have access to. Anyone in our town's on that. Um, all of our dispatchers have been trained on the whole program, the training program. They, they're not going to go out in the field and look for them, but they know what to ask. So uh, my thought when, I, when Justin and I trained all the dispatchers was, if they're going out, and the f they actually went out and looked for somebody. They went and looked for those bracelets. So they know, when, they know what questions to ask. So when we go out looking, they have those answers for us before we already go. Um, because we're on the regional search and rescue team, I have a very good rapport with a uh, lieutenant from the sheriff's department. Um, I have a book with everybody in the county because we don't know where we're going to go. We could go to Cushionet, Somerset, Swansea. They're all part of some of the communities. I have all that information, so when I'm going there, we already know who we're looking for, and every person uh, Ralph's going to talk about has their own separate frequency, so we know where we're going to go. So they're all registered. Once they have a GPS, yes. they're registered. Yes. Yeah. I, was, I was curious, how do you register if you have, say, a child that is autistic or on the spectrum that you, you said that you like to know where they live? Where, I, I can give you one of my business cards. Okay. Um, what we do is we, right now we're putting them in the system as a, in our terms, as a hazard. So when we go to that address, we know it's not a hazard to us, but that's, that's the way we categorize it. Right, so, yep, yep. Any other questions? I noticed that the Fenwick is available in Matt Boys in the Anything in the city that's different New Bedford and Fall River for, I don't know what reason, they decided not to become a member of Semlick. Uh, Taunton is, Taunton's a city, they're, they're one of the biggest contributors, manpower-wise, to the search and rescue team and, and the other teams. I don't, I don't know why, I couldn't, I couldn't answer why they didn't. I know there are people in New Bedford and Fall River, I have them in my book that are on the, the low jack safety net system. They're in there also, but I don't, I don't know. Worry, worry. My understanding is we're allowed to go to the communities that are part of, part of Semlek unless, uh, uh, you know, if that person were to be lost in town. Say you lived in uh, New Bedford, but you came, you came shopping at the mall and you picked up the phone and, you, and your, your husband or your child had one of the bracelets and they went missing. You would you would call 911. It, it'd be transferred to Dartmouth. Um, they would, our dispatchers would ask you all the information that they. They need to send us out looking for us. So it's basically where you are. So like, I mean, if I had that answer your question, if you're, if you're here in town, we're gonna go looking for you. I mean, there are mutual aid agreements and stuff like that if it ends up being a search like that. Yeah. But it, it, hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Any other questions? Okay. Um, you want to take a quick five-minute break while 
Ralph, Ralph's going to talk to you about the LoJack Safety Net program. That's uh, one of the programs that's out there. Um, he's going to give you a little information, a couple of videos on that. Well, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Dartmouth PD for inviting me down here um, with the Safety Net program to uh, kind of explain it to you guys. Uh, my name is Ralph Poland. I'm a retired police officer of the town of Marshfield. I did uh, 14 years on the PD and uh, three years Plymouth County crime scene. Uh, and now I work for Safety Net. I retired in 2012. And um, when, uh, when, we, when I was still on the PD in 2010, uh, just, this is just one example. In 2010, Marshfield Police went on a search for a gentleman with Alzheimer's. Um, and it was February, it was 22 degrees out. Uh, he walked out with no coat and his wife waited an hour before she called 911 because she thought maybe he would come back and then she and her daughter went out looking for him and couldn't find him so finally they called. Ten cops, four firefighters, two canines, state police center road trooper, environmental police center uh, an officer, the state police put a helicopter up and from eight o'clock at night till almost midnight we searched for him and couldn't find him. Um, all of those resources could not find this gentleman uh, in, in behind it, with this complex where he lived was um, acres and acres and acres of wood lines and uh, high tension lines um, all the way to Carver. So um, about quarter of 12, dispatch gets another 911 call for a stolen car in progress. And it was like a mile in the other direction. So all the cops and firefighters and all the search team are out in the woods looking for this guy, can't find him. Take two guys off the search team, send him on a stolen car report, that was him. By luck, he walked into somebody's open garage and at quarter of 12, the family came home. They go to pull into their garage, they see somebody sitting in the car. They think, oh my God, someone's stealing a car, call the cops. So the good news is he got found. The bad news is 10 cops, four firefighters, two canines, a state trooper, an environmental police officer, and a helicopter, what's that cost to run for an hour? For four hours, couldn't find this guy. So three, four weeks later, at the time I was a community service officer and I would go to the Council on Aging meetings once a month uh, and they would have talks uh, on, you know, for seniors or different things, how, how to not mix medications, what to do in a hurricane because we live right on the coast, things of that nature. And this one, one week they're talking about the safety net program. And this wasn't out of that guy's mouth two minutes when it was obvious to me that this should be in every town in the country. So we proceeded to get the program going in town, um, got, it, got it going, got all the officers and the fire department trained for search and rescue using this equipment, I'll show you in a minute, um, and off and running. We promoted the program in town, uh, went to the Council on Aging, went to the school system, uh, what they call it CPAC, Special Education Parent Advisory Council, and we let them know that now we have this uh, life-saving tool in our toolkit. Um, Long story short, there's about 28 people uh, on the program. It's half and half kids and, and seniors in, the, in, in town. So uh, we went two years with no search and rescue. Everything was fine. I retire in 2012. About a month later, the guy that took over the program for me, Officer Davis, calls me up and he says we had our first search to th that day. So I shot down to the police station and there was a gentleman that was on the safety net program and you're gonna see a video of it in a minute that I actually put the transmitter on him. And he had gone missing a few times uh, prior to being on this program. Uh, and his MO was he would, from where, and you'll see it in the video, where he lived, he would walk up a hill, take a right, go down to a general store at the end of the street, and everyone in there would pretend that Vinny, you know, uh, had money, and they'd give him a cup of coffee and a muffin, and he'd, he'd take it and start heading home and invariably get lost end up in somebody's living room, you know, the cops are looking for this guy for five hours, somebody comes home from work, and there's somebody in their living room sitting on the couch, and they have no idea who it is. And, you know, so when somebody goes missing, it, one of the questions is, which way did they go? And invariably, the answer is, nobody knows. So pick a point on the compass, and everybody spread out, and these guys know exactly what we're talking about. So um, Vinny goes missing, uh, his wife, Jenny, um, 
spent an hour looking for him, driving around, can't find him, and she drives to the police station. In the, in the video it says they called, but she didn't. She drove to the police station, and as she's walking into dispatch, Greg, the guy that took over for me, is standing there. He sees her walk in and he goes, Vinny's gone again, but this time he's on the safety net program. So Greg grabs the equipment, turns it on, shoots down to where he was last seen, which was his house, turns on the equipment on his specific frequency, and instantly gets a hit on Vinny's transmitter. At that point, they are, they're trained, they know what to do, how to adjust this equipment, and basically it says Vinny's over there, period. No one has to go anywhere else. Um, so he starts slogging through the marsh and the briars and so forth. He finds Vinny stuck in the mud at dead low tide in the South River, and Vinny's nonverbal. So he wasn't like the Boy Scouts that get lost yelling in the woods, hey, I'm over here, I'm over here. Vinny was just standing there waiting for the tide to come in to drown. So what I want to do right now is I want to show you a couple of videos. Uh, actually, there's three in a row. One of them is in uh, uh, one of the uh, battlefield areas in Virginia where uh, I believe a five-year-old boy with autism went missing and they searched for five days for him. Um, I'll tell you right off the bat, he was found alive, uh, dehydrated and you know, not so much worse for the wear, but they did find him alive. What I want you to look at, not discounting the fact that somebody's life was saved, but to look at the backgrounds Look at the, the busloads of people that were searching for this and listen to the amount of searches that were searching for this little boy in his five days. And toward the end when the sheriff is talking about he's been found, listen to how far he was away when they found him. And the antenna on this, um, we call a Yagi antenna, the distance on that on the ground is one mile. And from a helicopter, it's seven to 10 miles, depending on the, the, you know, the weather and so forth. So that's what I want you to look at on, on these, these three videos, is to keep an eye on the background, the line of porta potties, how many searchers are looking for this person, how many helicopters are flying above, how many canines, and the, the magnitude, the scope of this search, think about what did that cost us taxpayers? The municipalities, what, what, what did that cost in dollars and cents? Absolutely, it's the, the primary issue is to save somebody's life. But without a tracking device on, this is one of the consequences um, that, that we run across. Across this country, for years and years and years, this has been going on. This technology is old technology. And as you saw in one of Scott's um, uh, slides, that it's RF, radio frequency, it goes through everything. GPS, you have to have line of sight to a satellite. Um, uh, uh, cell, you have to have uh, towers to make sure that it's in the area where there are towers. But with radio frequency, it goes through everything. So take, for instance, a, um, a four-story uh, assisted living facility. Somebody's missing out of that. They don't know if they got out of the building or not. With this equipment, two officers, one on each end of the building, could tell within five minutes whether or not that person is still in that building or not. And if they are, you think about, uh, you, I'm sure you've got buildings around here, four-story building, what's it gonna take to search every floor, in every closet, under every desk, a school system, how, how, you know, what, how many people, or how long is it gonna take to find somebody? With radio frequency, it's basically directional, and it says the person's right there. So I'm going to show you these first three videos, um, and uh, it's they're, they're very short, but this is what happens. Another day has passed since a nine-year-old autistic boy disappeared while walking with his family on one of Virginia's battlefields. Hundreds of volunteers have joined in the search. Robert Wood Jr., known as Robbie, wandered away from his family at North Anna Battlefield Park north of Richmond on Sunday. Now search dogs have picked up the little boy's scent. The dogs have alerted on that scent in the area where he went missing, and it's taken us um, to the river, uh, to, the, to the North Anna River. Um, and in all other areas, the dogs haven't alerted yet. 
Nearly 900 volunteers were trained and then dispatched into a 2,000-acre search area Wednesday. The battlefield is not fenced in, so officials are concerned the child may have wandered off the property. The boy was last seen wearing a red long-sleeve T-shirt, blue athletic pants, and blue shoes, and because of his autism, he doesn't speak. Ross Simpson, the Associated Press. The vets, um, 900 searchers for five days, three meals a day, that have to be prepared for these people. So again, look in the background, you see the tents set up for, for preparing the food. Uh, 900 searchers, uh, 200 acres of unfenced land to look, that they have to look through. Uh, and again, it was uh, five days. The fall of darkness did not mean the end of a day's work for those trying to find a missing nine-year-old autistic boy. Dogs uh, work well at night because of uh, the way the air currents work, um, the way that the weather is at night, the dew points, things like that, uh, and the way the scent acts. Uh, makes things more conducive for the dogs to work in the evening. And search coordinators also say the night brings other benefits, like the fact that children tend to sleep at night, perhaps making it easier to find them. But that night search didn't locate Robert Wood Jr., known as Robbie. The boy wandered away from his father and brother as they hiked in a park near Richmond, Virginia, Sunday. Tucking my children in bed has taken on a whole new meeting. While crews worked through the night, others attended this candlelight vigil. I can imagine how much love his family has for him, but his community has it too. They hoped for the safe return of Robbie. Police say they are operating under the assumption that he is still alive. But it's a frustrating effort. With no results overnight, hundreds of volunteers were expected to be back at it Thursday, the fifth day of their work. Matt Friedman, the Associated Press. So that was day five, and they're still searching for that little boy. Um, good news is that, the, you know, the weather wasn't, uh, you know, three feet of snow and 20 degrees out in the middle of a blizzard, like it could be up here. Um, and they're, they're still looking for them, and they're under the hopes that he's still alive. So the, the next video is the, is the last one. Robert Wood Jr. has been found and reunited with his family. He was found at approximately 2 p.m., on the uh, Martin Marietta uh, quarry property. It was approximately three quarters to a mile from where he was last seen. The search is over, the investigation continues, and there are a lot of people to thank. It, it appeared to be a creek bed uh, next to the quarry property, uh, west of it. And when I say west of it, I'm talking about uh, just off of a roadway. Uh, and he was found down, it was somewhat of a gully. We had been told by the experts that we may very well find him in a fetal position, uh, and I think that's where, how we found him. But I know we have uh, searched that area before. I don't think, uh, you know, we've, we've had some, it's been a challenge uh, dealing with a child with special needs who's lost. I think you've all been made aware of those challenges. Uh, I can't tell you that he was there. I don't think we walked past him. Uh, we're just thankful that, that he was located. So they don't think they walked past him. He was less than a mile away from where they found him. And 900 searchers running through the woods looking for somebody. I find it hard to believe that that little nine-year-old boy was running behind trees and hiding behind bushes, evading all of those 900 people that were searching for him. I honestly believe that he was there for five days, curled up in the fetal position, and they just walked right by him. So um, that's, that's the extreme. That's an extreme of the searches that have gone on with the safety net program. Uh, since its inception, there's been over 400 uh, search and rescue operations. And I can't say, as like Scott mentioned, you can't say everything is foolproof 100%, but so far, every single uh, search and rescue has been successful. So uh, now I want to show you um, a video of the other extreme, like uh, the Vinny that I told you about that lives in Marshfield. Uh, it took one police officer from the time he found out that, that Vinny was missing till the time he found him was less than 25 minutes. One cop. Starts right now. And 
entangled in a marsh with high tide approaching, the family of a man on the South Shore had no idea just how much danger he was in. And as Christina Hager shows us tonight, a small piece of technology saved his life. Police say Vinny DiNatale is lucky to be alive, and because he suffers from Alzheimer's, he has no idea what a close call he's made it out of. He usually comes back within, a, you know, five or ten minutes, but he didn't. The 82-year-old had gone for a stroll up the couple's Marshfield Street. When he never came back, his wife Virginia called police. Luckily, he was wearing this, a new tracking device that sends signals to a special antenna. It can take a police cruiser to within three miles of the bracelet where a handheld antenna hones in. It narrows it right down to a pinpoint. Normally, when Mr. Di Natale goes out for a walk, he heads this way to his favorite store. But this time, he went the other way. This is where he ended up stuck deep in this marsh. He was in an area where nobody could see him. It was a remote area, uh, very close to the South River. Uh, he was trapped in a uh, patch of briars and uh, unable to get out. Police say they would have had no reason to check in the depths of this marsh, but for the little bracelet sending out signals. It basically saved his life today. The band around his ankle that Vinnie DiNatale had complained about at first. Now he's used to it, and his wife? I just feel so much calmer, just the fact that he has this dumb thing on here, and it works. In Marshfield, Christina Hager, WBZ News. I wish you didn't call it a dumb thing. But, you know, what can you do? But anyway, um, there's, that's the two extremes. Um, five days searching, 900 searchers, helicopters, dogs, everything. Um, and uh, like Scott, you saw on one of Scott's slides, 13,000 people a year across this country go missing and they're never found. They're just gone. Um, so with the safety net program, like I mentioned, it's a, a directional radio frequency tracking system. And I'm gonna, I, I set it up, um, I put a transmitter over in the kitchen there just to show you. So again, the question is, um, Mr. Mr. Smith with Alzheimer's or little Billy with autism is missing, and the question is which way did they go? Which way did he go? And the answer is nobody knows. But with this with this tracking equipment, you can barely hear a beep. Heavier, weaker, I know he's over there, that quick. No one has to go anywhere in those directions. The person that we're looking for is right over there. And, um, and it works. It's, uh, like I said, radio frequency tracking, and the, the officers are trained. We train them how to, how to manipulate that receiver. And as you're walking toward the, the direction that says over here this way, they, they adjust the, uh, what they call the gain on the receiver, and it just bar narrows down the, 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 uh, the track, so to speak, of the beam that's coming from that transmitter. So if somebody's hiding in the basement of a house or up a tree or hiding in a shed or somewhere, uh, and I'm sure these guys have experienced it, I know I have, when you're, you're tracking along and all of a sudden, instantly you lose the signal, that means you just passed the person. So they're either in something, in a shed, under a boat, in a car. Um, and it, it, uh, this, it's also what we call um, reverse saves because these uh, officers know what the safety net uh, bracelet looks like. There's been several what we call reverse saves. I'll just pass this around so you can see it. But um, two examples, um, Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia PD is trained and equipped as, as well as a bunch of uh, individual police departments in Pennsylvania. So anyway, a uh, school bus driver comes out of his house at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work and is this uh, naked little girl on his front lawn, has no idea who she is. So he throws a blanket around her, calls 911. The police show up. They notice the transmitter on this little girl's wrist. Now they know, take out your trusty buck knife, cut the bracelet off, open the back, inside is a frequency and an ID. They call dispatch, they say, we have a safety net client here, this, the frequency is 216123 ID number seven, who is it? Dispatch goes on our website, 
instantly they know it's Susie Smith. She has autism. She's nonverbal. She lives on 123 Main Street. Her parents are. Her siblings are. She has skin sensitivity issues and on and on and on, you know, diabetes or, or whatever. So now the cops know that this, where this little girl is, what her name is, and, and um, what her issue is. So they take her wrapped up in the blanket, go back to 123 Main Street, Knock on the door at 6 o'clock in the morning. Mommy and Daddy come to the door with their, you know, rubbing their eyes. What's going on? It's the police. Is this yours? They had no clue she was gone. So they, they checked. They have three children with autism. They checked at 11 o'clock at night, and all the kids were in bed sleeping. 6 o'clock in the morning, the police are bringing her home. So somewhere between 11 o'clock at night and 5 o'clock in the morning, she got out of the house. Uh, they have locks on the doors, locks on the windows, those little uh, finger hook locks, you know, like way up in the top, and these are just little kids. They found out later that she pushed a chair up to the door, got a box, put it on top of the chair, got up on top of the box, undid the latch, got down, put everything back, went out the door, closed the door behind her. So she got out without the parents even knowing it. Happens in assisted living facilities, in secure units, um, there's the statistics that say once, once a, uh, a day, somewhere in America, somebody walks out of an assisted, a secure assisted living facility, and there are ways that they know how to do it. Somebody with Alzheimer's doesn't mean that they, they're, they're not understanding things. There's a, a, a gentleman uh, whose uh, niece works for Lojack, and she was telling us a story that he was a CIA agent back in the 40s. And um, his job, he was a spy. And uh, he got he contracted Alzheimer's, was in a, a facility, and he kept escaping, and nobody knew how he was doing it. And they kept changing, the, you know, they had the, the buttons, you know, like the telephone pad buttons on the wall right by the door. They would change it every day. Couldn't figure out, he's still getting out. So then somebody started watching him. And what he would do is he would sit at a table right by the door, pretending he's reading the newspaper because he wanted out. And he would listen to the sound of the, what that keypad made. And when, some, when people weren't watching, he'd memorize the sound, go up and figure out what sound went with what number, beep, 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 out the door he goes. So the Brookline, Massachusetts, middle of the day, uh, police officer's driving down the street and he sees an elderly gentleman walking along just looking down, not paying any attention, um, slows down his cruiser and is just going at the same pace that this gentleman is walking. Now, if that happens to you and me, we're walking down the street and we see a cop car next to us, we're going, what's he doing? You know, why is he following me? Guy never looked. So the cop pulls up, gets out, walks over, hi, how you doing? No answer. Looks down, he sees the transmitter on the guy's wrist. So he says, oh, what's that? You know, again, whips out his buck knife, takes it off, opens it up. 216-427, ID number six, calls dispatch. Who is this? They hit, our dis they hit our website. This is Mr. Smith. He lives at a secure facility at 123 South Street. Mr. Smith, you want to, you know, we'll go get a cup of coffee? Sure, jumps in the cruiser. They bring him back. He's walking the guy in the facility as they're on the phone reporting him missing. So it, it works both ways. Um, in answer to your question about, uh, you know, if this covered by any kind of insurance issues or not, right now there is a bill in the house, and I'd ask you all to take one of these um, uh, handouts here. And what this is, is if this bill passes, it will be covered by uh, insurance. Medicaid, uh, mass health, whatever, private insurance, whatever insurance pro you know, program people have. <coughs> um, it went, so I'd ask you to call your state rep and senators or send them an email and ask them to please, you know, if they would uh, consider supporting that bill. Right now, my boss uh, is in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, speaking before Congress because there is a, a, a bill in the U.S. House. Um, there was a little boy that went missing uh, in uh, New York City. Um, and his first name is Avante, and he went missing, I believe, in November of last year. And 10 weeks later, his body parts started showing up in the East River. Uh, so Senator Schumer from New York State 
um, went right to the Justice Department and f uh, filed this bill that if, if it passes, will um, afford law enforcement a $50 million grant over five years for training, equipment, educating the public like this, putting on seminars about you know, how, how this is needed desperately uh, across this country. So what I'd ask you to do is call your U.S. Senator for this area and ask him or her to, uh, to uh, support that bill. Um, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the safety net program, uh, unlike other programs, is uh, throughout the country. Uh, the whole state of Massachusetts is covered. So if, there, if you were talking about, you know, if there was somebody in New Bedford that is on this program and um, New Bedford PD does not have this safety net program, the uh, county sheriff's department has it, the Massachusetts State Police has it, they have it in their air wing also. So also the islands are covered. So if somebody went on vacation, lived uh, here in Dartmouth and, and went to Martha's Vineyard on vacation with a child or an elderly person and went missing there, 911 to the cops, which goes by cell phone goes to the state police and they have it in their air wing also. Um, there is also uh, the whole state of Rhode Island is covered, central to southern Florida on the east coast. Uh, if you go on our website, I've got pamphlets here. Um, with the, uh, if you can go on the website and plug in, say if you, were, you lived in Dartmouth and a loved one was on this program, but you're going to Nebraska for a family outing or something, you can plug in their zip code where you're going and find out if in fact safety net is in that area yet or not. Um, so that's pretty much my story and I'm sticking to it. So if uh, anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer. Yes. It's $99 for the initial enrollment and $30 a month after that. It's a buck a day. It is. It is. Uh, and, and there are organizations, like when I started in Marshfield back in 2010, um, you know, some families like this, you know, one family has four kids with autism. So, you know, the, the cost starts to get a little prohibitive. And um, we put the word out. And believe it or not, uh, Marshfield is a population of about 25,000. All of the fraternal organizations, every single one of them, the, the Elks, the Masons, the Kiwanis, you name it, the Knights of Columbus, all exist for one thing, to raise money in their community to help people in their community. Again, there's uh, 28 people on it in Marshfield, and the Marshfield Police started a fund when we first started the program. And so far, the Marshfield Police pay for them all through donations from all of these organizations. So right now, you know, there are fraternal organizations out there that are desperately looking for, uh, for a cause. And once they find out about it, I've, I've been to the Wayne town of Weymouth. There was a family had two boys, uh, twin boys with autism. Uh, the chief, fire chief and police chief asked me to go to an um, uh, Eagles me meeting, you know, one of their uh, monthly meetings. I did and walked out of there with a check to cover both boys for a year. Um, so the, 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 there is funding, as, you know, all you have to do is go after it. Massachusetts State Police are out on the road every day. Looking for speeders and aggressive drivers. Aggressive driving to me is uh, excessive speed limit, following too closely. On their cell phones, 
texting. Unsafe lane changes, weaving in and out of traffic. Using the breakdown lane to get around cars. Okay, and the reason I stopped is you're doing 63 miles an hour and it's postage 50. We're not out here trying to be the bad people. We're saving lives. I gave you a warning. So consider yourself warned. We're out in force.